excited about today's speaker. Um, he has worked all over the United, all over the world as well as the United States. There are collectors of his work that live in all 50 states. There are collectors of his work that live in more than 50 different countries around the world. He has had exhibitions in major metropolitan areas such as London, New York, Los Angeles, Berlin, Naples, Sevilla. You guys should give a big lucky welcome to our visiting artist, Stephen Barnwell. Um, I thought it would be useful to give a very brief introduction of myself as an artist. Since the money art on display in the gallery is just one body of work uh, out of several that I've made in my lifetime, and I've worked in various different uh, media, so I'll just give a brief introduction of myself. So pretty much all my life I've been an artist since I was a little kid, and I was always drawing and experimenting and making things. Um, my father was an artist, he was a serious oil painter. And uh, so my sister I, my sister also became an artist. So we were very fortunate to have a parents that supported me in the arts as I was growing up. In fact, my father was such a serious painter that he took the best room in the house to be his studio. He lived in three houses when I was growing up, and he took the biggest and best room in the house to be his artist studio. I had a very understanding mother, and I have a very understanding wife, because I'm doing the same thing. Um, so as I said, I always drew, made things, I experimented. But my first love was actually photography. At the age of 13, I had my first photograph published in the local newspaper. At the age of 15, I had a dark room in the basement and I was processing and printing my own 45 millimeter film. And I was very active in photography in high school and I went to a Bard College where I studied filmmaking and photography. And just last year, I retired from a 36 year career as a commercial photographer and director of photography in New York City. But throughout all this time, I was making art. This is some of my early work. As you can see, what I first did was a lot of fantasy and surrealism, a little bit of science fiction thrown in for fun. My early influences were artists like René Magritte and Salvador Dali, as well as my own father who painted surrealism himself. The medium I used is colored pencil. I don't like brushes. I tried brushes. They don't like me. I don't like brushes. So I stuck to pencil, graphite, colored pencil, and pen and ink. And I did a lot of uh, freelance illustration at the time. I did a number of book covers and magazines and gaming products and various other little things. And for those of you who are gamers out there, a couple of big games that I worked on were collectible card games such as Heresy, Kingdom Come, and Mythos. A lot of my early work did set the stage for, for the money art. And things like uh, use borders, a lot of decorative elements such as borders, textures, and patterns. I use multiple images and symbols together in one drawing. And I combine words and images in the same image. But mainly they're about ideas. A lot of my early work was very conceptual. And as I look back after doing a few years of money art, I did money art for about 15 years. I look back and I noticed that my early work did inform the money art and influence it. Because at the time when I, did, when I discovered money art, it, was, it really kind of came out of the blue. It was almost accidental. So money art, as the name implies, is art that looks like money. Um, and feel free to laugh. What I do is political satire and, and political humor with the art, so feel free to laugh at my work, that's okay. Now money is a foundational element in our entire culture. Money often drives society, capitalism, and consumerism. Money dictates government policy. And money often guides our own decisions and behaviors. It's kind of the prime mover of our entire society and our own world which is why it's perfect for political satire and political commentary. The types of money art can be a lot of different things. It can be currency notes such as this, it can be stock certificates, coupons, stamps, bonds, whatever. Because money art uses the visual vocabulary and the visual language of financial documents. Now that financial vocabulary includes a few things. It should have an issuing authority or a state, such as the indebted states of America, and for me, that's usually the title of the piece and the clearest statement of the intent of the work. It should have a denomination or value, such as this is a trillion dollars. And it should have a vignette, which is like a scene or a portrait, either on the front or the back. And it should be numbered and dated. Then again, all fine art printmaking is usually numbered and dated. But all these elements, the vignette, the title, the denomination, even the color of the note, all these elements can be subverted for the purposes of satire. I want, you to look, I want you to look closely at the money art in the gallery 
is every single element, no matter how small, has been hacked and subverted for the purposes of satire. Now, in terms of aesthetics, many art uses engravings and line art pretty much exclusively. As I said, it has a lot of decorative elements, borders, textures, medallions, seals, and that creates a very layered, and complex textural depth, which I really like. It combines words and images together, because words and images together can make a more complex statement. And also, it gives, gives me lots of opportunities for puns and jokes. There's lots of puns in the art. Also, money art forces you to work within very tight restrictions. But that's true of a lot of art. Like a writer writing a sonnet or a haiku, artistry is often defined as working within limitations. Look at Picasso. He had a blue period where he used only blue pigments. Or Mondrian, who only painted with geometric shapes, thick black lines, and primary colors. Or the painter Seurat, who painted with pointillism, which is little dots of paint. And he limited himself to that particular style for his entire career. The self-imposed limits, kind of counterintuitively, are very liberating. I find that they actually increase creativity. Because too many choices can lead to paralysis. Writers can get writer's block, but artists can also get artist block. But if you remove the clutter of unnecessary choices, it helps to refine and focus your aesthetic vision. It gives you a framework to work within. So instead of going broad, you can go deep. You can really drill down and deeply explore a theme, a style, or an idea. But having said that, I always like to break out of conventions. This is a later work in which I've kind of discarded a lot of those uh, conventions that I talked about, because rules are made to be broken, but rules give you a starting point, and you can break free from there. Now, believe it or not, money art is, a is essentially anti-establishment. It is transgressive by nature. Like graffiti and other forms of street art, money art is illegal. Making your own money is illegal. It's called counterfeiting. Now, here's another money artist. His name is J.S.G. Boggs. And he did money art so accurately, it looked like a real currency, that his studio was raided by the Secret Service. They never charged him with a crime, but they took everything from the studio and they never gave it back. Now, what he did with money art was kind of different than what I was doing. He questioned the value of money its, itself. He saw money as a kind of a consensual reality, where the faith we put him in actually would, that was, would, would be of its own its value. It was nothing inherent in its value. And I mention this because money art, like all fine art genres, different artists can use it in different ways and explore different ideas. But ultimately for me, money art is about ideas. I don't like to make purely aesthetic images. I like to communicate ideas. Because I think art needs to say something. And I use money art to comment on society. Also, there are elements of storytelling in my work, as words and images together often tell a story. And multiple images together can often create a narrative or a false narrative. And also because it looks like money, it becomes more of an object than, let's say, a fine art print, which makes it seem like an artifact from a world that doesn't exist or shouldn't exist. Now, a lot of my older work, this is an earlier piece, was also about ideas. This piece is called Necessity Stepchild. It's based on the old motto, necessity is the mother of invention, because if necessity's child is invention, her inevitable stepchild is pollution. And many times I would reach back into my old body of work and appropriate my own symbols and put them in the money art, such as I did here. And that really helped integrate money art into my larger body of work. And it helped, helped me develop my own personal visual vocabulary and my own library of symbols and icons that are just for me. But most of all, for me, money art is appropriating the language of power. It is only governments can make money. Money is the tool of the state. So by using the visual vocabulary of the, of the establishment, I can turn it against them. I like to call it stealing the voice of power to criticize power. And I find that's more potent than many other forms of political art. And I use satire and humor because that helps, it's less threatening. People often put up barriers, especially with political ideas. People put up barriers or preconceived ideas or their own attitudes. And humor kind of bypasses that. And it helps them to see things from a different perspective. So my journey into money art literally started with a dream. In the early 90s, 
I was living in New York City, and I was part of the dream group where we met every week to discuss our dreams. We did dream work and dream analysis. We would even give each other homework to have a dream during the week, and then we discuss it the next week. So I took my dreams very seriously. And so in the early 90s, I had this dream where I was in the New York City subway system, and I suddenly found myself with a lot of really weird, bizarre, colorful money, all different shapes and sizes. And so in the dream, I took this large table and I set it up in the subway, and I spread out all the money, art, all the money, and this crowd gathered, and they started taking the money, and I was like, please take it. And I was happy to give it away, and they were happy to have it. Everybody was laughing and smiling. It was a really good dream. So I woke it up, I woke up, and I wrote it down. I said, I wrote down all my dreams. And then I kind of forgot about it. And several years later, around 1999, I wanted to, at the time I was an independent filmmaker, and I had a production company, and I had a website to promote it. So I was trying to think of an unusual uh, promotional piece to promote the website. And then I remembered the dream. At the time, I mean, the company was called Antarctica Film Arts. So I thought it was perfect. I could make these really bizarre dollar bills from Antarctica, and I would give them away and use it as a promotional item. So as, even, at, even at the beginning, you can see they're hand stamped with individual serial numbers, even from the very beginning. And so I started giving them away. I left them in restaurants, in, in, in bars, on tables, on the street, everywhere I could. I was just leaving them all over the city. And they proved to be extremely popular. In fact, one time I was having dinner with some friends, and I left the, the, the money art as, in addition to the tip, I didn't tip, I didn't skip my servers. And we went outside, we were talking, and suddenly the waitress comes running out. She said, are you the guy with the money art? I'm like, yeah. She said, can I have another one? My manager took it. So I gave her another piece, she went inside, and then the busboy came running out. Can I have one too? Yeah, sure. So it was, it was surprisingly popular. So after the four dollar bill, I made a one dollar bill, then I made a seven dollar bill. And it was at that point that I realized that something was happening, something was developing here. So it was at that time that I committed to creating the full-blown project of Antarctica Dream Dollars. I wrote a story about a utopian colony of artists and writers and philosophers and free thinkers that left America and Europe, went down to Antarctica, dug underneath the ice shelf, underneath the glacier, and built a, a utopian colony at the bottom of the world. It was called Nadiria. And so I wrote the story, and the story informed more dream dollars, and the dream dollars informed the story. It was kind of a nice symbiotic relationship. And it, uh, it eventually developed into eight different denominations, which I call the natural number system. They reflect the natural rhythms and cycles of nature. Uh, they occur over the four years. There are 365 days in a year. So one times 365 is one year. There are four seasons in a year times 91 days in a season. There are seven days in a week times 52 weeks in a year. And there are 13 lunar cycles in a year times 28 days in a lunar cycle. In addition to that, I made four different mid-marks, winter, spring, summer, and autumn. For each denomination, there was a slight or large variation in the design for the four different mints. And that created a total of 32 different notes in the Dream Dollar system. It took five years to complete, roughly from 1999 to 2004. And it, it, I started getting it out there, I was selling them on eBay, selling them on my website, and the media started to, to react. And my first major review was, believe it or not, from a financial journal in Bucharest, Romania. But thankfully, the, uh, the author contacted me, otherwise I would never find out about it. And it got written up in a bunch of other blogs and websites, and the momentum started to take off. And uh, this is my favorite review. It's from Wired Magazine. It's still my favorite review. And also gallery invitations came. Um, I actually didn't seek out gallery uh, work, gallery exhibitions. At the time, I was rather cynical about galleries. I thought it was the art industry, so I never actually pursued gallery, gallery shows. But now they're coming to me. I got invited into shows in the, in the United Kingdom, in New York City, and eventually in Paris at the Palais de Tokyo Contemporary Art Museum. So things were going great, and then 9-11 happened. Now, a lot of you are, are kind of young who appreciate the full impact that 9-11 had, and you may be tired of hearing about it, but 9-11 changed the world. It was a huge impact on American society and on the world. It was a pivotal event, and it actually politicized me. Before that, I was completely apolitical. As you saw, for 20 years, I was doing fantasy and surrealist art, but now, 
That event awoke within me a social and political consciousness, and I felt the need to comment on world events and what was happening with my art. So I created my first political note. The first note is the United States of Islam note. I did several. It was my first political note. It was inspired directly by the Iraq War of 2003. It was my first political note. It was my first anti-war note. Then I felt I had to comment on the greater war on terror, which is still happening today. It was really a thought experiment. What if we lost and the Taliban took over? The Taliban was the enemy at the time we were fighting in Afghanistan. So it was a, it was a cautionary tale. I wanted to think the unthinkable. What if America lost? Because as a superpower, we never asked that question, which makes us enter into war far too easily. As the wars continued, I did more political notes. This is the empire of America. And this is really when I discovered the fun of deconstructing national icons. Subverting cultural symbols really evoked strong emotions in a lot of people. And some people had an almost religious fervor for national symbols. And I found that very interesting. And I found that challenging them was even more interesting. On the back of that note, I took the, uh, the iconic image of George Washington crossing the Delaware, and that was George Washington crossing the Euphrates. Again, hacking an iconic image of the state. So as the wars dragged on, I wanted to make stronger and stronger statements about the wars. This is the stay of war note. I mean, it's pretty on the nose. That's the angel of death, or the god of war, however you want to see it. The hand stamp there, which is applied with a rubber hand, hand stamp. That's the ace of spades. That's the traditional symbol for death. And I was trying to keep pushing the limits. On the back of the note, there's a pile of skulls amongst oil barrels. That's pretty on the nose there. But at the time, in the years, in the early years of those wars, there were protesters chanting in the streets, no blood for oil. So this was a kind of commentary on that. And that's what a lot of my work is. It's, I'm trying to reflect what's happening in the country and in our culture at the time, kind of making comments on the historical moment that I'm in. So it's not necessarily what I believe. The face value may not necessarily be views that I style, but I'm simply trying to comment on what the culture is is doing around me. And as I said, in terms of turning all the elements towards satire, the denomination is $13, the unlucky number 13. The color of the note is blood red. And there are the corporate tribes at the bottom. If you go into any European castle, you'll see the banners and standards of all the clans that took part in the wars. Well, these are the corporate clans that are taking part in these wars. And this also started to get me more gallery shows and more media coverage. And galleries like political art, I found that out. Especially in the years right after 9-11, they really like political art, but they still do today. So after doing these really small notes for so many years, I kind of felt the need to stretch myself. I needed a bigger canvas. So this is when I switched to making certificates. These resemble stock certificates rather than currency notes. They're printed on only one side, but I still felt they could give me more complexity in what I could do with them. Also, I could use a lot more mixed media instead of having just straight prints. I had these stamps made. These are not stickers. These are old-fashioned posted stamps, which have the dry gum adhesive on the back and they're perforated. So I would, lick, I would tear them off, lick them, and stick them, which means my DNA is on all these prints. Um, I also made rubber stamps, again, like some of the earlier notes. I'd make a piece of art, make a custom rubber stamp, so the lean pad, I would hand stamp each one individually. And uh, this, this certificate had a watermark in the paper. I found this company in Chicago that made chemical watermarks. Now, if you're not familiar with what a watermark is, it's a chemical treatment so that the, the letters HC in the chain, the light it actually shines through brighter. It's a kind of a security feature. And for you non-chemistry majors out there, the HC of the chain stands for a hydrocarbon chain, which is what all fossil fuels are. And finally, on this note, I had, a, this, this is a gold foil sticker, but I made a custom embosser to emboss the images, the, the letters, no more cheap oil, so it's custom embossed as well. Now, these certificates really help me to expand the scope of my work. The earlier notes, the small notes are political, they're about the government. The certificates allowed me to look at larger issues, the common on corporations, consumerism, and capitalism, and society in general, not just the government. I wanted to investigate more timeless and universal concepts. I wanted to look at the larger cultural picture 
to find a more universal meaning in the work, not just simply commenting on current events. And around this time, I discovered that good political art really did three things. It should reference the past, it should observe the present, and it should remain meaningful to future viewers. And how it does that is by finding deeper truths within the current events. Because that's what elevates it about propaganda, jingoism, or simple political cartoon. Because all good art reveals truths about the human condition. Also around this time, I got a little restless. I was making prints, getting in galleries, which is great, but I, was, I wanted to be a little more, more participatory. I wanted to engage in a little political activism with my work. So in 2009, I created the Indebted States of America, primarily in response to the Great Recession of 2008. And around that time, there were trillion dollar bailouts for the banks, bailouts for the auto industry, bailouts for financial institutions. So in 2010, I decided to have my own bailout for America. I took the trillion dollar notes I had just made, and I sent them to all 535 representatives and senators in the United States Congress. I included a letter of urging fiscal restraint and responsibility. I even designed letterhead and stationery with the, with the, what's on the back of the note to create a nice branded package. The response from Congress was rather underwhelming, but I did get interviewed for an article in congress.org. They were doing an article on how art is used in activism. And it was also covered in a bunch of blogs and websites, most notably The Art of the Prank by Joey Skaggs. And Joey Skaggs is the, is the country's number one political prankster. You may want to check him out. So in 2011, an unusual opportunity presented itself. I'd heard about through a friend of a, of a currency design competition for the official Occupy Wall Street movement. So after commenting on culture for years, I wanted to be part of something, or to participate in history rather than observing it and shooting spitballs from the back of the room. Now, I didn't agree with many of Occupy's positions. They were a little scattershot in what they were saying. But better Wall Street regulation is always a good idea because frankly, the Great Recession of 2008 was caused by kind of bad Wall Street regulations. I'd heard about this only 10 days before the, the deadline, so I had to drop everything and kind of slam it together really fast, which is why I reused the exploding banker uh, image from the first nationalized bank certificate. And what Occupy, what they wanted to do was create a souvenir note. They were going to sell the note to raise money for the movement, but also they were going to give them away to the people who are picketing and standing, protesting in line. Because if you're there for days, you're going to make some friends. And so the idea was to pass them around. People could sign the back of the note. And uh, there's the back of the note. You'd have all your friends sign it, so you'd have a souvenir with all the signatures on it. What attracted uh, me about that was that it's actually a tradition from World War II. At the end of World War II, near the end, I guess, the guys would pass around dollar bills, and all the older buddies in, the, in their unit would sign it, and it was a souvenir note. So that's a tradition that goes all the way back to World War II, and that's, that really uh, interested me. So needless to say, I won the competition, but unfortunately the, the movement fizzled out shortly after that. But they still, they still had the note, and one thing they did do is they submitted it to the Guardian newspaper, and it was covered in a special issue of the Guardian in London in December of 2011. So that was some nice coverage. Now, perhaps the boldest statement and the strongest statement I've ever made with the money art was when I was invited to participate in an exhibition at the Zealand's Post and Newspaper Offices in Copenhagen, Denmark. Now, Zealand's Post was the epi epicenter of the infamous Mohammed Cartoon Jihad of 2005. You may not remember it, so I'll set the stage. In the years after 9-11, there were several terrorist attacks in Europe designed to intimidate the press and the media most notably the assassination of the Dutch filmmaker Theo van Gogh in 2004 by a jihadist. So in 2005, Jeelens Posten commissioned 12 cartoons of Muhammad from 12 professional political cartoonists, and they printed it in a special issue to assert a free press. Well, needless to say, throughout the Middle East and throughout Europe, the reaction was pretty violent. There were riots, and violence, murder, and mayhem, in which over 125 people died over cartoons. So in 2007, there was a special exhibition at the Zealand's Post and Offices meant to commemorate the event. Now here's the image, it's a little strong. One year, it's a little strong image. I was invited into the, into the show, and I was very honored to be invited in. So, and they made this piece 
specifically for the show. You can see that would be the portrait of the president or the bay or it's Mohammed. So I left it blank to comment on the current day prohibition of showing his image. And the blood there, the fake blood, is meant to commemorate the over 125 people who died. And I felt it was important to make a strong statement against the attacks on freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And as you, because these were attacked from artists, not just journalists. Theo Van Gogh was an independent filmmaker, and the cartoonists were artists. And as you, as you may remember, only three short years ago, there was a similar attack in the Charlie Hebdo magazine offices in Paris. So I felt it was important to make a strong statement. On a lighter note, in 2012, I embarked on a series of prints which I call coupons. These are simpler ideas um, and simpler designs, which are only one side on security paper, and they're being made quickly to be timely on current events. I could, I, could, I could push these out in about one or two days, rather than several weeks or even a couple of months, and that made them a lot more similar to traditional political cartoons. Integral to the concept of the coupons, though, is that they're to be given away. I wanted, I wanted to be true to the original dream I had, and I wanted to make these and, and distribute them on the street and give them away for free. It's kind of my form of street art. And because I find that finding art in person, if you find it on the street, it has more of an impact than just seeing art on the web. So it's kind of a personal confrontation with the work. So what I did was I dropped them all over town in New York, I would just spread out some coupons, take some photographs, and then I'd walk away and leave the coupons there for people to find them. This was the very first drop, and that is the exact spot in the subway where I had the dream in the early 90s. I wanted to come full circle to that dream. And I made a lot of drops for several years. I even mailed some to friends in foreign cities to leave them all over there on the condition that we photographed it. So I'd have something for Instagram and Facebook. Here's another drop. These are free gun coupons, and that is at the New York City Hall. I had to wait about 20 minutes for all the cops to walk away before I could drop them. There's some in the uh, General Post Office. Here's a, at the Jacob Javits Center in New York, declaring it radiation free. And finally, these are the Syrian gas mask coupons, which I made in response to the Syrian chemical weapons attacks. And that's at the United Nations building in New York. So I thought it would be useful this time to kind of go through my process and how I make the notes and how I make the certificates. As you can, as you can probably guess, they're very complex collages done in Photoshop, with a combination of scanned engravings and hand-drawn elements. Now when I do collage, I don't want it to look like collage. Some collage artists kind of slam all these random things together, which is interesting, but I prefer to make collage art that looks like it was designed that way. It does not it look like a collage which actually makes it a lot harder because you have to find images that are extremely compatible and that work well together. I would spend hours and hours looking for just the right image. At home I have a collection of several hundred uh, vintage books and periodicals, ranging in dates from 1850 to about 1920. And when I finally find an image that I can use, I scan it at a very high resolution, usually around 1200 dpi or higher. And they combine a lot of hand-drawn elements, too. That's the hand-drawn title for Electric Nation. Because I, I enjoy drawing. I could do this in Adobe Illustrator. But I prefer to hand-draw because I love drawing. It's a way of keeping my hand drawing. Because you don't do so much computer art. I like to work with my hands. So here's the original pen and ink uh, title. And there it is incorporated into the final print. So let's build a certificate from scratch. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's the First Nationalized Bank of America. And so what I do is I, I take the certificate almost to completion in black and white, and I add color as the very last step. And so the first thing I do is I start with the vignette, the exploding banker with the capital dome, that's the vignette of the piece. And the portrait of the vignette for me is the heart of the piece. It's the center of gravity of the whole print. So I always start with the vignette or portrait first. So there's the original scan of the source image where I get the banker. As you can see, I didn't like the head. So the first thing I do is I isolate it. To take all the back, I'm just isolate just the element I want and clean it up. I found his head from another one. These both come from a Harper's Illustrated Weekly from around 1880. And I wanted that head for the banker mainly because the top hat. The top hat is kind of the universal symbol for capitalist or banker. So when you combine images like this, it's, it's, they have to be really compatible, as I said. 
they're, most engravings are very, very different. Uh, the first thing you have to look out for is the direction of light. If you have the light coming from the left and the shadows on the right, everything in there has to be, has, the light has to be coming from the same direction. And also the line weight often varies. Some engravers use thick lines, some use very thin lines, so you can't combine those. And also the style. Some engravers are very, very photorealistic, very tight, and some are very loose and sketchy. You can't combine those. So everything, the line weight, the style, everything has to match. When you finally find just the right element, you'll do a lot of resizing and manipulation, and especially cleanup. Hours and hours of cleanup. Because remember that these, these uh, books and magazines that I'm getting them from are usually very cheaply printed. Uh, the newspapers, a lot of them are cheaply printed, so they're either under inked or over inked in the printing process. Plus, they're really old. The paper has turned yellow or even brown. So every element has to be really cleaned up just to make it usable. So they continued. I took the money from the right side and moved it onto the left side, and I added some more to make a nice arc. Then I added a background behind it, which is a kind of generic plate of the Capitol building. But you can see I ghosted it back about 50%. So I really believe in having a good foreground background separation. It really helps the image read if you have a good separation between the foreground and background. That comes from my photography training. And lastly, I put a white vignette around it to actually make it a vignette. So this is usually done in a separate, separate file. I take this flat bit and drop it into the main file, which is this. And with the vignette, I usually start with the border because that really defines the space. And I just add layer after layer and keep building up element by element. This already has let's see, five or six elements already. And I add some more borders on the inside, add some corner elements and even shading. You can see the, uh, there's some shadows behind it to kind of make, create a 3D effect. Created some text boxes and some, some flags. And you can slowly build it up layer after layer. Because what's important to do in Photoshop is, is to do non-destructive editing. You can't take several elements and combine them because then you're stuck. You can't go back and rearrange them later. So each and every element is on its own layer. And many of these, many of these files have 50 to 70 layers in them of just separate elements on all these different layers. And I keep building up the complexity as I go. There's the title. There's some more title, and they darken the area behind the word first to make the word first pop out. Now, the word about the lettering is I rarely use fonts. A lot of the lettering and titling that I use is also scanned from documents. Because for one thing, fonts don't have the right kind of font that I need. These are very antique looking lettering and a lot of fonts don't have that. But more importantly, modern fonts are just too clean. Now, these are all scanned from, from actual source files, source images, and they have a kind of, kind of a dirty look, kind of an organic look. And if the fonts are too clean, they won't match. So, so, so even the lettering has to be scanned to have that same kind of organic feeling to it. So add more lettering, more numbers, and numerals are also scanned. Those are not fonts. And more and more layers are going in because a lot of these documents have a certain level of complexity that you have to match. If you make it too simple, I don't think it would be as successful. You have to match the complexity of what real money has to trigger that response in the viewer that says money, because we all have kind of instinctual responses to money, and I think that's what helps give the, uh, give the money in our work its power, because we are we're trained from birth to have a certain emotional reaction to money, and that's what I'm kind of exploiting in my work as well. And finally, adding some more official elements and things. You can see on the left side, there's the, uh, the usury seal. I took the treasury seal and hacked it into a usury seal. And I've reused elements like that in a number of different prints. Because um, I find that reusing elements, besides being a big time saver, it, it links them together into a more unified body of work. It creates a kind of brand or a style across the whole, all of my work. It, it really links them together. Artists like Shepard Ferry does the same thing. He reuses a lot of symbols and elements in a lot of his prints. And that because you, you can recognize the Shepard Ferry on site because he has a certain style. That's what I'm doing here. So as I said, the last step is color. Now, I didn't go step by step with color because that would probably take too much time. But uh, the one thing I will say is that when I do the color, I don't, since every layer is, every black and white element is on its own layer, you don't want to move the brush and apply the color right to that object. Again, that's destructive editing. That would, you know, if you back you into the corner, you want to go back to black and white. It wouldn't be black and white, it'd be gray and white. So you want to keep everything non-destructive. So. 
Each and every black and white layer has a color layer above it. So if I had 60 layers of black and white, the final document would have 120 layers with a color layer for each black and white layer. And for you Photoshop geeks out there, what the, the exact process of what I do is I, I would select the black and white element, create a color layer, put that selection on that layer, and fill that with a flat color, and then use layer properties to apply the color. And the layer properties I use the most are screen and overlay, not maybe too much information. <laughs> so now it's ready, this is the print file, and I print them all myself on a color laser printer at home. I don't send them out to be printed because I like to have control over the process. So what I do is I take this very big document, I flatten it out, and I leave the serial number, which is at number 123, I leave the serial number with editable text, so I can print serial numbers unique to each print. I change it to 101, print it, looks good, change it to 102, print it. So I print them one at a time with individual serial numbers. And now it's ready for the multimedia to be applied. Uh, again, I went to the guy in Germany who makes these post-it stamps. This is how I get them in an uncut sheet. So I would tear them off, lick them, and stick them on, and there it is applied to the document. For this one, I made both yellow and red stamps. There was the artwork for the rubber stamp, and that's really easy to do. You just simply print it out at the same size you want, give it to a shop, and they'll make you a custom rubber stamp. And then there's the final document with the stamps and seals applied, and it's done. In conclusion, I'd just like to state a few things. Since, uh, since my work is very political, I have a few political things to say. Um, freedom of speech is very important to me, and it should be important to all of us. And satire is a form of political speech. Political speech is the most protected speech under the First Amendment. As Evelyn Beatrice Hall once famously said, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. That's what the First Amendment is all about. Because speech must be free to offend. Because if you speak the truth, you will offend somebody. Trust me. I've been criticized by both the left and the right, but I consider that a badge of honor. People ask me if I'm a Democrat or a Republican, I just say, no, I'm a South Parkist. I make fun of both sides. It's a lot of fun. So I urge you to be bold as an artist. Don't be afraid. Because I believe it's the artist's job to speak the truth as you see it. And not just political truths. There are human truths, emotional truths, and personal truths. Because all art is about speaking the truth. And on a practical note, bold statements get noticed. If you make very safe, kind of non-risky art, that's great if you enjoy it. But, but bold statements get noticed by gallerists, curators, and the media. But don't be, don't be gratuitously offensive. Don't be a troll. Because nobody likes a troll. And, and trolls are dismissed. And you don't want your truth to be dismissed. Because real diversity is diversity of ideas. And I want, finally, I want you to say to let your art guide you, follow your art, and trust where it's leading you. Be open to the unexpected. Don't be afraid to go down a path that you didn't expect or look for. I never expected to make money art. For 20 years, I was making fantasy drawings and surrealist. But the money art is some of my best work and certainly the most successful in galleries and museums. And finally, art should feed your soul and be fun. Because art making is hard work. A lot of you know that. Especially if you do art every day, all day. It's hard work. So you need to incorporate play into your work. And for me, art making is play. It will take years to become established as an artist. You know, there's, there's a million artists out there. They're all on Instagram, they're all on Facebook, they're all on Twitter. So, but if you make art fun, if you enjoy the process of making art, that will, that will help you to persevere through a lot of the inevitable uh, rejections and disappointments. Plus, it will help you not to give up. I've known many artists that have simply given up because it is hard. So if you make art making play, that's half the battle already. So take risks, be vulnerable, tell the truth. And in the great words of Joseph Campbell, follow your bliss. Thank you. I do have one little surprise for you. Um, I told you about the dream I had in the 90s where I sat at a table and put out money art to give it away for free. And that's what we're doing outside. was a table of money art and it's going to be given away for free. So feel free to grab, to grab a few pieces for yourself, absolutely free. 
Please don't take too many. We'll leave some for everybody, but go out and grab some cream and have some fun. Thank you.